So I'm going to talk about moths in prairies. You may not have thought that of moths as being part of the prairie, but they are. They're a really important part of it. Um, a lot of people think about um, prairies as a collection of plants, but as you know, there's a lot more than plant, just plants in the prairies. There are um, frogs and birds and mammals and fungi <laughs> and insects. And all of them are part of the co that complicated web of interactions that happen in prairies. And it seems to me the more we can learn about all these creatures, the more we can understand those prairie ecosystems better. Many of you know that we own an old farm in Buffalo County. It was a dairy farm until the 1970s. And then we, since uh, we bought it in 2000, we've been working to bring it back to the prairie in Savannah that was there before the land was settled. So this is, this is actually the farm from a d picture from a drone. Um, we've planted prairie in all the old crop fields. And we're working to open up and restore the remnant prairies. This is a bluff prairie and the savannas. Um, so watching these, you know, living there and watching all these prairies and savannas return, I'm always reminded how, of how rich this um, prairie landscape is. Um, they're endlessly fascinating. There are all kinds of things going on and I, I keep trying to learn about every creature that lives there. Um, and I've gotten especially interested in insects. There are so many, and there are so many different ways that they interact with the plants. I started by looking at butterflies, um, identifying the all the different kinds that we have, and I found about 80 different species on our land, which is, I think, pretty standard for this area. You probably have about the same number here. Um, and then I thought, thought I would try to see what kinds of moths we have. And it turns out that there are a lot more moths than there are butterflies. So in Wisconsin, there are about 155 different species of butterflies. In Wisconsin, there are about 2,400 species of, of moths, as far as we know. I got so entranced with moths, that's, that's as far as I've gotten. <laughs> so I, I do look at other insects, and I try to learn about them, but I'm pretty stuck on moths, and I'm, I'm still focusing pretty much on them. So far, I've identified it. I've identified about 830 species on our land of moths. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what moths are and how they're different from butterflies. A lot of you may know this already, but I thought I'd just go over it real fast. They're both, both moths and butterflies are in the same order of insects called the Lepidoptera, which means scale-winged. They both have wings. They have little tiny scales on them, and that's what make the patterns and the colors that we see. The wings are very delicate, so if you touch the wings and then take your hand away, you'll see powder on your hands, and that powder is the scales coming off. And this is what they look like under a microscope. Butterflies and moths go, both through the, go through the same kind of life cycle. It's called complete metamorphosis, which means that they have four life cycle stages that all look different from each other. So they have eggs. And larvae, and in, in uh, moths and butterflies, they're called caterpillars. And pupa, and adults. Moths and butterflies are pretty similar. In fact, many people say that butterflies are just a different kind of moth, a certain ki a kind of moth. Um, there are a few commonly used distinctions that don't actually work very well. One of them is that people think of butterflies as flying during the day and moths flying during the, the ni night. But actually, there are quite a few moth, moths that fly only during the day. Um, people also think about butterflies as being very colorful and moths being dull colored. But there are a lot of dull colored butterflies and there are a lot of bright colored moths. So those distinctions don't work very well. So the best way to actually tell is by looking at their antenna. So you can see the butterfly antenna are thicker at the ends, kind of like a baseball bat, where it's thinner at the beginning and then thicker as it goes out. And moths antennas are either tapered to a point, like the one on the bottom, or more like feathers. So here's an even better picture of those. Moth, two different kind of feathers, and the point, going to a point, and then those two different kinds of butterfly antennas. 
Sometimes they have hooks on the end, sometimes they're just round, but they're always thicker on the outside. Um, so one of the interesting things about both, both moths and butterflies is what they eat. And that's the way they interact with plants, one of the ways they interact with plants. Um, the adults of butterflies and moths eat kind of the same things. So adult moths, um, many of them eat nectar from flowers. So this one is on common milkweed at night. And you can see his tongue reaching down into the milkweed. Um, oh, I, I didn't say it. So a lot of moths also eat tree sap, just the way some butterflies do, mostly in the spring and fall when there aren't very many flowers available. So they'll go and suck on the, trap, the sap that comes out of trees. And then there's some adult moths that don't eat at all. So this is one of them, a luna moth. They don't even have any mouth parts anymore because they don't eat as adults. They only do their eating as caterpillars. But moth caterpillars and butterfly caterpillars all eat. Um, and they eat different things depending on what species they are. So you all know about monarchs, that monarchs eat only milkweed, right? But they eat different kinds of milkweed, different species. And so these are three different milkweed caterpillars on three different kinds of milkweed. And there are a lot of moths that are the same way. Some moths will eat a broader range of things. Some moths will only eat a few things. Some moths will only eat one specific species. So they're all different. Um, and like other animals, moths have different habitat preferences. Some of them like prairies better. Some of them like woods better. Um, I'm going to show you pictures that of moths that at least can be found in prairies. Some of them are found in prairies and other places as well. Um, some of them are only found in prairies. And I'll, I'll try to say when they're only found in prairies, I'll try to, try to tell you that. But um, all of these could be found in the prairie. And I'm going to start with some of the really big ones. So this is one of the biggest ones. It's called Polyphemus. And it's as big as my hand spread out. They're really gorgeous moths. And they're quite common. People don't see them because they only fly at night. Um, they're, the caterpillars eat, well, I'm going to talk a lot about what the caterpillars eat of these different creatures. Because that's, um, since the, the adults eat nectar from flowers, you can find flowers all over the place. But the kinds of plants they eat are really important. So the, all of these, pretty much all of these moths that I'm going to show you eat plants that are found in prairies. So these, um, their caterpillars eat um, oak leaves. That's what I've always found them on. They are, they are also supposed to eat other kinds, some other kinds of um, shrubs and small trees, but I've always seen them on oak. So they're found in savannas and probably also in woods. So this is the caterpillar eating an oak leaf. And the caterpillars get very big too, you know, they get like this long and bigger around than your thumb. They're quite spectacular. So here's another cocoon of another, so it's in, that's, uh, polyphemus moths are in a family called the giant silk moths. And they're the biggest um, moths that we have in North America. They, they include the biggest ones. This is an, another cocoon of a moth in that family um, called Promethea. And this is a really good time to find the cocoons. The caterpillars eat cherry, leaves of cherries. So, and then they make their cocoons like this. They take a leaf and they uh, strengthen the, the um, attachment from the, le the leaf to the twig with some silk so that it doesn't fall off. And then they roll it around themselves and they build their cocoon inside. And so if you walk around and if you see a cherry tree with these little leaves hanging down like Christmas ornaments, <coughs> those are usually have cocoons in them. And so this, one of the cool things about this, cat, this moth is that the adults, the males and the females, look different. So this is a male and this is a female. They're really beautiful. They're not quite as big as the, poly, as the polyphemus. They're a little bit smaller but still quite large and really spectacular. And the other interesting thing about them is that they mate in the afternoons. Most of these other, the other giant silk moths uh, fly at night and mate at night, so it's hard to see them. The 
um, Prometheus mate in the afternoons, late afternoons, sort of five to seven-ish. And so if you collect some of those cocoons from a cherry tree and you bring them home and put them in a cage out, at outside temperatures, in May, usually the end of May, they'll start hatching. And if you get a female, you could just hold on to her in, the, in a cage and the males will come to her to mate. So there's a mated pair. And this is what the caterpillars look like. The caterpillars are really cool. Yeah, they have that kind of blue, uh, frosty look to them. They're really neat. So another group of pretty big moths, not quite as big as the giant silk moths, are sphinx moths. Um, and their caterpillars are quite distinctive. They have this, see the horn mm -hmm. at that end? That's on the tail end. And almost all the sphinx caterpillars have that. So if you find it, a lot of times people find these caterpillars and say, wow, it's got this big thing sticking out of it. Well, those are all sphinx caterpillars. This one is eating Monarda. This is the same caterpillar. Um, one of the things that caterpillars do, you probably know this, is when, as they grow, their skin doesn't grow with them. So as they grow, they need to shed the skin they've got and, and they have a larger one underneath that then they can grow into. And then, so they do that shedding of their skin usually around five times differing with different creatures. But, um, and so every time they do that, they can look different. So they're not only all these different kinds of caterpillars, each caterpillar of each species look different, but even within a species, the different, they're called instars, the different um, instars look different, may look different, they don't always. So in many caterpillars, the last instar before they pupate um, is, quite, is often quite different, and it's, it's often darker or redder so this one went from a green caterpillar, it was a green caterpillar all the way along, and then this last instar it turned dark brown. And that's what the adult looks like. This is another sphinx moth. Um, this one eats bed straw and um, fireweed, epilobium. And uh, this one is kind of neat because you see on its right front leg, that's a little, um, the pollinia from a milkweed plant, milkweed flower. So those are the little pouches that hold the pollen, milkweed pollen. So it's clearly visited a milkweed and has stuck its leg in and pulled out the pollinia and now it has to visit another milkweed and pollinate it. Mm -hmm. This is, an, now we're into another group. Um, these are called flower moths. And many of these groups, are, these moths are much smaller. You can see this is a, a silky aster flower. So those are very small. Those are like this big. So this moth is really tiny. Um, and these moths eat the flowers and the seeds of plants, all the moths in this group. And many of them are very particular about which ones they eat. So this one is quite, uh, rare in Wisconsin. In fact, the ones on our land are the northernmost ones that anybody's ever found in Wisconsin. So if you look on your dry prairies in the fall, maybe you'll find some of these. Um, they, their caterpillars eat the flowers and seeds of the little purple asters that live on dry prairies. That's it. That's all they eat. They have one generation a year one of the reasons people don't see them very much is they only have one generation a year, and most of that time they're a pupa at the ground or under the ground. And the rest, they come out in September. Um, the adults hatch in September. They mate and lay eggs within about a week. The caterpillars grow and eat for about another week or two, and then they make a pupa. That's it. That's the only, you know, so for that month and a half, they're out in the open and otherwise they're under the, under the ground. So there's another one. This is the first time I'd ever seen it sitting, an adult sitting on something that wasn't a purple aster. So there's the caterpillar. 
And you can see, when I first, I opened up the flower, because it looked like it had, um, had some, somebody been eating it. So I, I pulled open the flower, and it had already eaten the seeds out of the middle. And then when, it, when I startled it, it crawled down the stem. So this is another flower moth. Um, similar size, very tiny. Um, this one, the caterpillars eat um, false bone set, Cunia eupatorioides. And this is what the caterpillar looks like. I've never found one of these. I found the adults, but not the caterpillars. This is a pretty common flower moth. Um, it eats, the caterpillars eat asters and goldenrod, and I've just never found the caterpillars. I don't know why, but I, I see the adults a lot. This is an unusual one that I really want to find. I've been looking and looking. It's, um, it eats the buds of evening primrose. And the adults sit in the flowers of evening primrose with their heads down into the flower and their little wings sticking up. So they should be easy to find, and I've just never found it. This is a goldenrod flower moth, and they eat Goldenrod and I think asters too. I've always found them on goldenrod, so this is the caterpillar on goldenrod. And it's a fairly common one, fairly common moth. They're very pretty little moths. This is a really unusual one that I've never found. Um, it's caterpillars only eat lead plant flowers. And that's a really special one, so if you ever find it, it's a big deal. Let me know. <laughs> and here's another one that's really cool, another one I would love to find. This one is endangered in Wisconsin. So again, if you find it, tell somebody about it. Take a photograph. Um, there it is. It's really small. It's a phlox moth. The caterpillars eat phlox flowers and, and maybe seeds, I'm not sure. And um, they, the adults usually rest on the flowers. So this is another group of moths um, called borer moths. And they're, they're called borers because they bore into the stem or into the roots. And then they eat the insides of the stems of the roots. So this is an adult that eats, um, it will eat, uh, let's see, I've got a picture of the caterpillar. There's a picture of the caterpillar inside a root. So this is, <clears throat> these will eat wild indigo, dogbane, and angelica. I don't know why those three, but anyway, that's, and this one's inside of a dogbane stem. And the caterpillars aren't very, these caterpillars are not very showy, maybe because they're inside all the time. They don't have to look, you know, they don't have to deter predators or anything because they're protected inside this, these stems. This is a, an adult of a boar moth that eats culver's root roots, bores into culver's root roots. And this one, I think this one's really cool. This one um, bores into the stems of columbine. And so the caterpillars are really tiny. And MJ took this picture of one inside a columbine stem. And think of how big those columbine stems are. They're really tiny. This is a really unusual borer moth. And so if you find this one, this is another pretty big deal. It's um, it's, and we don't know a lot about exactly it's what its lifestyle is. It's caterpillars, um, its main food source of the caterpillar seems to be um, bottle brush grass. And so it gets in the stems or the roots of bottle brush grass. But then as the caterpillars get older, sometimes at least, they move over into completely different plants, either lilies or mayapple, into their stems. And we don't know if they have to move into those other plants or if they, they just do it when sometimes and why they would go into a completely different kind of plant. Nobody knows. So then there, here's another group of moths called underwings. Underwings have upper wings, which are uh, pretty um, good for camouflage. You know, they're usually grays and browns and white, not very showy. But then the underwings are quite bright. And this, this is one where the caterpillars eat um, lead plant leaves. So here are the caterpillars. And the, the lower one is in its last stage before it 
turns into a pupa, so it's red. So it's changed color. This is another underwing. This one eats oak, I think. Yeah. These also eat oak. One of the interesting things about underwings is, is that sometimes the adults have different color forms. So it's the same species. Both these are the same species. But sometimes they look like that, and sometimes they look like that. And a lot of the underwings have that. And so you have to learn not only however many underwings there are, but all the different variations of them. So now there's just going to be some miscellaneous in, uh, moths, not necessarily in the same group. This one um, is a beautiful little moth that the caterpillars eat um, lead plant, and also um, false wild indigo, I guess it's called. It's a bushy, um, not so much a prairie thing. This is a really neat, um, very common moth. It's very pretty, pretty small, you know, like this. And the cool thing about it is it's caterpillars, which eat um, asters and golden, I think asters and things in the composite family. So the, the caterpillars are also called uh, camouflage loopers. And they're loopers, they're, they're, the, they're like inchworms. They're the same kind of, you know what inchworms look like, right? Inchworms are all, pretty much all the same family of moths. And this is one in that family. So they look like inchworms. And they take pieces of the flower that they're eating and decorate themselves with them. Aren't they cool? They're very tiny. The caterpillars are like this long. They're really hard to find. This is, a, this is one that's really associated with prairies. I've only ever seen it in prairies. And I see the caterpillar a lot more often than I see the adult, probably because my, the places where I look at moths are mostly not actually in a prairie. Um, so it may be that the, the adults tend to stay in prairies. Um, but that's the caterpillar, and it eats milkweeds. Um, I've only ever seen it on the kind of milkweeds that grow in dry prairies, so um, world milkweed, butterfly weed, and green milkweed are the three that I've seen it on. I've never seen it on a common milkweed. And it's pretty unusual. It's one of the ones that is special and if you find it. This is another one that's on the state. I don't know if it's on any of the state lists anymore, but it's one that they kind of keep track of because there aren't very many of them. The caterpillars eat switchgrass. And it may eat other grasses, but we don't really know. We know for sure that it eats switchgrass. So this one's neat. My, uh, my friend MJ, who you've seen some of her pictures, um, was helping, was working uh, with some other people on describing this moth. It was, um, it had never been named or described before. And it, um, its caterpillars eat um, triostium perfoliatum, which is um, tinker's weed or another name is um, horse gentian. Is that familiar? It's a savannah plant. And so she was doing this in, this work in Iowa, and I thought, well, I'll go look at my plants and see what I got. And I went and looked, and sure enough, there were all these caterpillars. <laughs> so I brought them home and raised them into adults, and now this is the first recorded instance of them in Wisconsin. I'm sure that there are lots more, but nobody's ever looked because it's a brand new species. So this is what the adults look like. And the tricky thing is that the adults look exactly like another species. Exactly. You can't tell the difference from the adults, but you can tell the difference from the caterpillars. They look different and they eat different things. So they're definitely different, but the adult looks, adults look the same. This is another one that we um, actually don't know what they eat, what the caterpillars eat, but it seems to be associated with prairies. Um, only, people only ever find them in prairies. And it doesn't even have a common name. It's just. And this is another one that doesn't have a common name. Also associated with prairies. And um, the caterpillar eats bone set, false bone set, cunia, eupatorioides. So all the, the moths I've shown you so far are what are called macro moths. They're pretty big, you know, an inch or more. Even the ones that are an inch 
I think are pretty small, but they're not, they're still called macro moths. And then there's a whole group, mo actually more than half of the moths that we have are micro moths. So they're really tiny. Some of them are so small that when you look at them with your eyes, you're not even sure if they're moths. So now I'm going to show you a few micro moths. This is one, this is one of the larger ones. Um, and the caterpillars eat monarda, so they're found in prairies. And they're, you, see, you can see them because they're so bright colored, they're really pretty. I think it's called a raspberry perustra. <laughs> perustra is the genus. This one is really cool. This one I've only found on not one of my prairies, somebody else's prairie. Um, it's a very steep, sandy prairie, um, dry prairie. And this is the adult, and the caterpillar makes these, I've never actually seen a caterpillar, but they build these um, tunnels around the stem of the food plant. They, they eat, um, here at least, they eat um, sand cherry. And on the East Coast, apparently, they, they also live in very sandy places, but they eat some, a few other things. But here they seem to, the ones that I've seen only eat sand cherry. And they build these little tunnels. There's in one more picture of a tunnel. And they build them clearly so that they can get up to the leaves and eat them without being exposed, you know, being safe. There's a wonderful description from the late 1800s, some, you know, there were a lot of people who were interested in this, you know, watching um, caterpillars go through their life cycle in the, in the late 1800s. And so, the, and they, they recorded all these things that they saw, their observations. And there's a wonderful piece um, about this moth. He, he brought some home, he found some caterpillars, and he brought them home and put them in a sort of an aquarium with sand and some of his food, the food plant. And he described watching them make these tunnels. Wow. It would be fun to do. So this is a gall. So we were talking about galls. When, sometimes when insects um, eat a plant or damage a plant, um, the plant grows in kind of a funny way. And depending on the insect that does it and how they do it, it damages the plant in a very characteristic way. So you can tell by looking at a gall what kind of insect, I can't, but if you're good at galls, you can tell what kind of insect made the gall. And some of the galls are made by flies and some are made by wasps, but some are made by moths as well. So this is one, this is a moth that makes that kind of a gall, just sort of a thickening in the stem of a goldenrod plant. This is another one that might be a little more familiar, also gold, on goldenrod, and there's the adult. And there's the, she cut the gall open so you could see the caterpillar inside. And then I think she put it back together because this is the moth that came out from that caterpillar. So she put it back together and taped it up and <laughs> let it finish. And then there are leaf mines. You know what leaf mines are? Mm -hmm. Well, leaf mines are made by little creatures, usually little larvae of either, they can be fly larvae or caterpillars or you know other kinds of larvae and they eat between the layers of the leaf and they're very characteristic so the, the mine um, the way the mine looks can tell you what the insect is and I just this is a little deceiving this slide because I didn't have any pictures of the these two these two moths both make leaf mines but I didn't have any pictures of those leaf mines so I just wanted to show you what leaf mines look like. So these are not, I think the one on the top left is actually a fly mine, and I don't know what this one is. But just so you can see what leaf mines look like. So now, now that I've got you all interested, <laughs> how, do you, how do you find moths? Um, and one way to do this is to put up lights, because moths are generally attract, not all moths, but most moths are attracted to lights. And you can use any light. So if you have a porch light or any kind of outside light, there will be moths that will be attracted to it. Um, moths tend to like lights that are more at the blue end of the spectrum. So the bluer your light, the more and the brighter it is, the more moths you'll get. So this is my moth setup. I um, show the lights against our garage door. I have a sheet that I put up, and then I shine the lights on it. So that makes a bigger 
um, light place that hopefully will attract more moths. And it also gives the moths a place to rest. So they'll come in and they'll sit on the sheet and they just sit there and so I can take pictures of them. They tend to be pretty quiet when they, when they come into a light. Once they kind of settle down, they'll sit on the sheet and it's great for photographing. And then I leave the other lights on too, just as a little extra light to try to bring in a few more moths. And there's a closer picture of the sheet and the setup. You can see it's pretty goofy. You can use, um, you can use just uh, black lights from you know, Home Depot or someplace like that. You can buy black light bulbs. Um, and these are just shop lights. Moths really like dark nights, so you won't get as many when there's a bright moon. So dark nights, nights when there's no wind, they like better. Um, humid nights, so they like humidity, calm, dark, warm, all those things. But you, you know, this was actually a very late, I start seeing moths in March, and I stop seeing them in November. So you can really push the ends of the season a lot on a warm, you know, a 50 degree March or November night, you'll get moths. So this was, a, this was late in the fall. This is kind of what you see on the sheet. You know, you'll see moth, but then you see lots of other creatures too. So it's kind of fun to see what else comes. Lots of different creatures are attracted to light. So this is, there's a hopper. I want to learn more about hoppers. That's my next thing. And then these are both caddis flies, and I'm, I'm not sure what that one is. So another way to attract moths is to use bait. And the bait that um, most people make for moths is uh, mimics tree sap. And what people usually do is mash old fruit, usually old bananas, <coughs> and you get those nice black bananas, those are perfect. And you mash them up and put it, uh, about half bananas and half brown sugar and mash it all together, and then let it sit for a few days. You can put beer in if you want to kind of <laughs> start the fermentation going. Um, and then paint it on trees on tree trunks or leaves or branches, wherever you want. And um, you do that during the day, and then just the best time is right after, sun, you know, right, right after it gets dark. Um, walk around and look and see what you've got. And the bait usually lasts for a couple days. It, it's actually usually better the second night. If it doesn't rain, it'll last. Um, and I think the moss may have to figure out where it is, and, and so they learn, and then the second night is always better. When you shine a light, will that start it then? It does. Yeah. This is not as nice as the lighting for that reason, because the moths are much more easy to startle. So one way you can do it, if, if you're really serious about this, you can bring along a little bot, a jar and stick it underneath the one you really care about and go, oh, I want a picture of that one. And you stick a jar underneath, and if you just get close, it'll drop. That's what they usually do is they just fall. So if you're underneath the jar, the jar you know, fall into the jar. And then you can take it back into the house and, um, and photograph it. So another thing I've been trying, which is really fun, is to get a UV flashlight and walk around at night and shine it at bushes and trees. And a lot of the caterpillars will shine in UV light. A lot of other things will too. You'll find mushrooms and um, millipedes really shine in the light. So there are all kinds of other things you'll discover too. But caterpillars are great. And so this is, what the, this is the difference between the white light and the, and the UV light. Wow. It's the same caterpillar. And the other thing to do is when you're walking around during the day, just keep your eyes open for sort of odd things about plants. So sometimes there are leaf rolls, you know, places where leaves are rolled or crinkled or something. And if you pull them apart really carefully, you can find an insect inside. So there's a leaf roll. This is a flower that's rolled that's kind of rolled up together, and if you pulled it apart, there's a caterpillar inside. And this is a, on a fern, there was a caterpillar inside there. And so one of these is, a, um, is the nest for a butterfly. This one's a butterfly nest. So this is a caterpillar of the American lady. In, um, I call it sweet overlast, everlasting, but I don't think that's the real common name of it. Anyway, that's a, a butterfly nest, but the same kinds of things, you know. So if you're walking around and looking in prairies, just watch for sort of odd things like that. And they may not all be moths. Some of them may be other kinds of creatures. 
Another thing that you can do to learn about moths is to rear the caterpillars. So if you find a caterpillar, a lot of times the only way to find out what it is is to bring it home and raise it and see what it turns into, what the adult is, because it's a lot easier to identify the adults generally. So this is the, these are the containers I use to raise caterpillars. And here's one I raised. This is, I found this on um, Hori Vervain. And it, I took it home and fed it more fresh leaves every day for, I don't know, a week. And then it made a pupa. And a few weeks later, it hatched into a moth. So you'd also probably want to be photographing all this, especially if you're going to be rearing the insects. It's fun to, it's great to take pictures of all those stages because in many cases we don't know what all the stages are of all these insects. So if you can record them, that's a great citizen science project. Um, so you can use all different kinds of cameras, whatever camera you have. You, you know, if you fiddle around with the settings, you can usually figure out a way to photograph these moths. You need to get, be able to get good clear pictures, so being able to take macro photo <coughs> photos is a big deal. Um, and you can spend a lot of money on cameras, but you don't need to spend a lot of money on cameras. So this is somebody taking a photo with a, an iPhone. This is my setup right now. Um, it's changed recently, and you, it, you know, I still had to fiddle with settings, and I had to put this little silly flashlight on the top because the the camera really doesn't like to take pictures at night. It's just too dark for it. So I put the little flashlight to give it a little help with the focusing. And then you need a way to identify them. So there, there are some books now. Um, these are, the one in the middle is great. It's a pretty recent book and it's been very helpful. Um, it's nice to be able to flip through a book and have some pictures to look at so you can kind of get an idea at least where your moth fits in the scheme of things. Um, and no book is going is to have all of them because they're just too many, but at least you can get close. This one is really good. If you're just beginning, this one's terrific because it doesn't have very many species and it has all the real common ones. And so it's a great way to start. And then there's one of caterpillars, which is really good. Also doesn't have all of them. This one has uh, butterfly caterpillars as well as moth caterpillars. And I brought all those books along, so if you want to look at any of them, they're up in the front. And then there are really good websites that talk about that, uh, where you can learn about moths. This one is my favorite. This is a great place to learn about all kinds of insects. It's basically an insect collection, except that it's a collection of photographs rather than actual physical insects. And if you get, you don't have to write all these things down. I'll give you the stuff later. If you, um, if you get an account, that, you know, if you get an account on Bug Guide, you can uh, post images to their catalog. You can become part of their collection. You can post images that will be uh, included, or you can post images and say, and as an ID request, and ask people to help you figure out what they are. Um, so it's, it's a really great resource. And it has all different kinds of insects, not just moths. And this one is really good for moths. This is a uh, moth photographer's group. And they have, you can't submit things to them, but they have each page about a moth is like this. And so they have distribution and examples of what the moths look like. They usually also, ha I think I just don't have them on this page, they also have spread moths, so pinned moths, so you can actually see the hind wings and the way they look when they're spread out. They usually have those also. Um, and they're starting to add caterpillar pictures now, so they're getting even better. So I'm going to bring out up one con controversial subject at the end here, <laughs> and that is burning. Burning is really hard on insects. and so. It's not too bad for generalists, things that will eat almost anything, because you can, they can be found all around, and it's pretty easy for them to come back if you know, the ones in, in the burn area get burned up. They're usually ones on the outside that, that can come back in and repopulate it. But if they depend on a particular plant, which is only found in the area where you're burning, that's a problem. If you burn it up, you may have burned up that whole population, and there's nowhere else for them to come from. So, uh, and it's especially, you know, the rarer the plant is, the rarer the insect is, the harder it is on them. 
So um, just think about that when you're planning burns. Um, try not to burn a whole area at the same time, divide it into burn units and burn maybe one a year and one the next year and one the next year. Have some areas which are never burned so that they always hold on to their insects. Um, that's all. I, just be conscious of the insects, that there are insects there, they're important, and burning's really hard on them. Borer moths, the ones that live inside stems, those are particularly vulnerable because they spend so much of their lives inside insect stems, and when you burn the insect stems, they're gone. You kill them all. One of the things that I've read about prairie, you know, maintaining prairies, is patchy management is the best kind of management. So don't do the same thing everywhere. You know, don't mow everywhere. Don't burn everywhere. Don't leave it all without any management everywhere. Do different things in different places so that you're leaving different kinds of habitat, different kinds of situations for different things. And that's the way to get the biggest diversity in creatures. So when you look at your prairies, I hope you'll think not just about the plants, but about some of the creatures that might live there, some of the insects. And um, keep your eyes open. Hopefully you'll start seeing more. And this is my website where I have, this is all the stuff that I thought you might be interested in. There are links to all these things on the main page of the website. So there's a, there's a link to moth watching, which has a lot of the techniques that I talked about, the lighting and bait and all that stuff. Um, there's a, a link to my inventory of the moths that I found on our place with pictures of all of them. There's a, a section on raising, rearing caterpillars, so if you're interested in doing that, I have lots of suggestions about containers and you know how to do it. And I have a section on burning prairies with a lot of information about ways that you can burn without um, endangering insect populations. And then there's my email address. I'm happy to talk to anybody about moths anytime. And if you have a picture of them, you know, it's important to take pictures of moths because you can't communicate with people unless you have good pictures. So, but if you have a picture and you have uh, had trouble getting it identified, write me, don't send me the picture and I'll have, I'll try to help. Okay. I'm ha I'll stick around, so if you want to come look at the books. Um, yeah. Thank you.